Good afternoon. This is Dr. Weiss, and I am going to be discussing a little bit about Kate Chopin and a little bit about her life. And this is going to be part one of the analysis of her 1899 novel, The Awakening. A little bit of information about Kate Chopin. She was born Catherine of Flaherty. She lived from 1850 to 1904. Uh, she was known as a short story writer and as a novelist, and we're going to talk about her literary legacy and how she is viewed today. She was an early American writer, an early American female writer, and by many accounts, and I think there's a very strong argument to make, that she was an early American feminist writer. She was born in Missouri and with her family moved to Louisiana when her husband died. She moved back to St. Louis with her children. She spent uh, her married life, a portion of her married life in the South in Louisiana, and many of her short stories and novels take place in the South, take place in Louisiana. And she was interested in the sort of clashing of cultures or the different identities that existed in Southern culture. Uh, some of her uh, more famous short stories and short story collections, The Bayou Folk was published in 1894 and A Night in Acadie, 1897. Some of her important, now those were short story collections and some of her important short stories were Desiree's Baby, 1893, which is in <clears throat> the Heath Anthology of American Literature, 7th edition, volume C. I highly recommend that story. It is not very long at all. The Story of an Hour, also another one of her highly anthologized short stories. It is also in the Heath Anthology of Literature, 7th edition. This was published in 1894. This is a, a really a fantastic short story. It is the story of how uh, a young woman... Her husband was supposedly killed in a train accident, and she goes through these sort of moments of grief, but are they? Is she grieving? And there's really a, a beautiful uh, passage uh, right after she is, um, uh, it is known that uh, her husband, or she is told that her husband has died, and let me just read this to you, and for those of you who might be following. This passage is on page 1081 of the Heath Anthology of Literature, 7th edition, volume C. Four paragraphs down. She could see into the open square before her house, the tops of the trees that were all a quiver with the new spring life. The delicious breath of rain was in the air. In the street below, a peddler was crying his wares. The notes of a distant song, which some... Uh, which someone was singing, reached her faintly, and countless sparrows were twittering in the eaves. And this is, I think, such a, a wonderful passage in so many ways. This is a woman who's supposed to be grieving, and there's the symbolism of spring, fertility, and passion, and beauty, and all of those sorts of things. So the story of an hour. The Storm, another one of her famous short stories, 1898. And, of course, The Awakening, uh, really the novel that um, for us in many ways uh, as she was rediscovered uh, uh, while she was alive the awakening was the novel that she published that really put her on the literary map an earlier novel and this was a very controversial uh, novel and we'll get to we'll get to that in a little bit in general she was known for writing about the inner lives of women and their standing in family and society. And by the time we get to the end of our analysis, um, I think that uh, we're going to be able to create a substantial list of all of the various themes that we can flesh out in the awakening. And many of these themes transcend the awakening and are apparent in many of Chopin's earlier texts. Um, and, you know, so she also writes about the complexity of Southern culture. Um, and let me also bring this to our attention. Uh, one of her earlier novels, At Fault, which was published in 1890. This was a highly controversial novel when it was published. It, it, it deals with alcoholism and divorce, and uh, which were, you know, risque subjects at the time. The heroine of the novel, however, is a young 
widow. <clears throat> and so when we talk about a woman's role and what kind of opportunity and what kind of uh, what kind of things that a woman can do uh, according to society in the early 19th or 20th century, you have a single woman, then you have a married woman, and then you have um, a widower, uh, a, a woman, uh, a widowed woman, somebody who has lost her husband. Now, in some ways, the single woman has, in some ways, more freedom than a married woman, because then a married woman fits into the family dynamic, and it's a patriarchal household and a patriarchal society. But a widowed woman has a little bit more freedom and can do some different things. She doesn't have the pressure, let's say, to get married. She's already done that. That has already happened. So the kinds of thematic elements, the thematic strands that Chopin was working in, which again were uh, highly critical of society and spoke to a woman's place and uh, various freedoms and things like that, these were considered very controversial with a heroine who was widowed. When we get to the awakening, now the heroine, Edna Pontellier, is not does not have that freedom of being a widow. She is a married woman. So in a way, Chopin was working out some of these earlier controversial themes in a somewhat safe place, a widowed woman, and then she goes all in uh, nine years later or so with the awakening. Now, like many of <clears throat> the literary texts, uh, particularly by women, both uh, that we have explored in the, in the particular course that I'm teaching right now, 18, American literature, 1865 to 1920. Many of the women writers may or may not have been quote unquote famous in the early 19th or early 20th century, but have been rediscovered. And Kate Chopin falls, I think, into this category. Now, there's some confusion, I think, around Kate Chopin, because in a quick survey of various sources, she was well-known, then she wasn't well-known, she was sort of forgotten, and she was rediscovered. And that's sort of, I think, um, the accepted, accepted pattern that Kate Chopin was treated, although I came across some sources that said Kate Chopin was or has been an accepted female literary figure ever since she was alive. And I really don't think that was true. Most scholars uh, place her sort of disappearing uh, within a decade after she had died. And with uh, some of the uh, early waves of feminism in the 1950s and 1960s, along with an overall desire in literary scholarship to recover voices that had been lost. So in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, as I've discussed elsewhere, literary scholarship has roamed one's country, roamed the world, looking for things that have been published, that have gone out of print by women, by women of color, by people of color, by voices that have been silent for any number of years. And so those voices are slowly being recovered. And I think Kate Chopin was one of those voices, and we are much better for being able to read Kate Chopin's The Awakening. What I'm also very interested in is, uh, you know, uh, again, the sort of dynamics of literary scholarship and how it has changed, and that, you know, oftentimes you as a student or you as a person interested in literature <clears throat> come to a class or a particular list of literary texts, and we sometimes think, oh, you know what, this is uh, an interesting list. This is what people have been studying for a long period of time, 100 years, 200 years, 50 years, whatever it might be. And literary scholarship is dynamic. And uh, Kate Chopin, her placement in literary history, uh, it's come and gone, and it has come back in the last 50 years or so. And I think that's very exciting. What is very interesting to me, uh, not necessarily as a scholar, uh, but uh, just a, 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 an interesting way to place the context of the text that we are dealing with today 
in literary history is to, you know, for me to say this is an important book and this is why we're reading it today. What did people in the 19th century, early 20th century, how did they view Kei Chopin's The Awakening? And I have for you uh, several quotations from various critics from the late 19th century, and I'd like to read a couple of them. While Kate Chopin was recognized as uh, a kind of literary great, uh, the sort of professionals, literary critics, journals, newspapers, they didn't all always see the work that Kate Chopin was producing as great. Now, Kate Chopin was a very prolific writer. She wrote a lot of short stories. She was published in, in various journals, um, including Vogue and, and, and in other places. Um, but not everybody agreed that she was a great writer and the sorts of things that she was dealing with were acceptable uh, for society at that point. They didn't think that how Kate Chopin or what Kate Chopin was dealing with in some of her texts uh, weren't all that great. Not a good thing for society at the time. But anyways, let me read a couple of these uh, uh, critiques from the St. Louis Globe Democrat from 1899, referring specifically to The Awakening. It is not a healthy book. If it points any particular moral or teaches any lesson, the fact is not apparent. But there is no denying the fact that it deals with existent conditions and without attempting a solution, handles a problem that obtrudes, its, uh, obtrudes itself only too frequently in the social life of people with whom the question of food and clothing is not the all-absorbing one. What's what's really fascinating to me, and perhaps we're looking at this, you know, of course I'm looking at this with a modern sensibility, modern sense of history and equity and, and, and things like that, but um, looking at a variety of these different critiques on Mary Chopin and, and other, uh, particularly women writers of the 19th and early 20th century, people just didn't, uh, particularly men, male critics, um, very dismissive, and they don't really seem to have gotten it. And I think some of the critiques are so far wrong, it's, to me, it's amazing that they were published. And yet, at the same time, it's, it's understandable. From the St. Louis Post-Dispatch from 1899, I think this is a, a, a different sentiment. There may be many opinions touching other aspects of Mrs. Chopin's novel, The Awakening, but all must concede its flawless art. Okay, so here is a critic that has uh, has an idea as to what's going on. It is sad and mad and bad, but it is all consummate art. The theme is difficult, but it is handled with cunning craft. The work is more than unusual. It is unique. The integrity of its art is that of well-knit individuality at one with itself, with nothing superfluous to weaken the impression of a perfect whole. And from the Providence Sunday Journal from June 1899, Ms. Kate Chopin is another clever woman, but she has put her cleverness to a very bad use. In The Awakening, the purport of the story can hardly be described in language fit for its publication, meaning shouldn't have been published. It wasn't so good. So this is just a sort of sampling on how The Awakening was received. Okay, so let's begin our analysis. I'm on page 1082. I often find that in the very beginning of a literary text, the first few lines sometimes, the first paragraph, the first page, many of the themes that are fleshed out in the entirety of the literary text, whether it's a short story or a longer novel, are often apparent in the beginning. And I find, and sometimes we're not aware of that, we have to read more of the novel, then we go back and we say, oh yeah, the signs were already there. But I find that to be the case here in the beginning of this text. Let's uh, read a passage. The beginning of the novel. A green and yellow parrot, which hung in a cage outside the door, kept repeating over and over, Allez-vous-en, allez-vous-en, ça pristi, that's all right. He could speak a little Spanish and also a language which nobody understood unless it was the mockingbird that hung on the other side of the door, whistling his fluty notes out upon the breeze with maddening 
persistence. Okay, so I threw the gauntlet down. Many of the themes or some of the themes that are apparent in the rest of the novel are apparent in the very beginning. Okay, what are they? Well, in this beginning passage, uh, some things I think are set up for us. A green and yellow parrot. A parrot is an exotic bird. It's a tropical bird. And the Grand Eel, the Grand Isle, is this area off the coast of Louisiana where wealthier people go for the summer. It's much, much cooler. If you've ever been to New Orleans in the summer, it's very hot. And wealthier people get to go or go to, they have uh, bungalows or cottages uh, on this island. So this is exotic. That the cage is in a bird, or excuse me, I should say, that the cage, uh, that the bird is in a cage outside the door. What does this mean? Well, we have Edna Pontellier, and she is a kind of exotic specimen, exotic woman, different from other people. She feels, as this novel gets underway, as we find out later, that she feels imprisoned. And thus, in the very first line of the text, we have a symbol, I would argue, that represents Edna Pontellier. What does this parrot speak? Well, the parent, uh, the parrot uh, obviously speaks French, but also a little bit of Spanish. And we find out later on that other people are not familiar with Spanish. There's a, a scene where Robert is speaking to uh, Marie Quita or Marie Quita, and um, they are speaking Spanish and Edna and other people are not familiar uh, because they don't speak Spanish. They don't know what they are talking about. So there is misunderstanding. And then there's a language which nobody else understood at all. This particular language that is specific to the parrot, much like the kind of language that Edna Pontellier might speak, that other people around her might not be aware or comprehend what it is she's trying to communicate. Uh, case in point, number one example, her husband. And what is it that we are told about Mr. Pontellier? Now, let's just back up for a moment. As we go through this text, we are going to see that there is uh, a separation, an alienation between Mr. Pontellier and Edna Pontellier. However, I think we have to be fair. Mr. Let me say this at the beginning. Mr. Pontellier, I don't think, is a bad guy. Do we have to put him in an historical and cultural context? Yes, but I want to point out some moments where he does some, I think, very affectionate things. Does that mean Edna is in love with him? No, but we'll, we'll see where, uh, where that gets us to. Okay, so in this next paragraph, Mr. Pontellier unable to read his newspaper. Well, what is a newspaper? A, newspa a newspaper is a print source that is trying to communicate something. He's unable to read it. We go down a couple more paragraphs. Mr. Pontellier wore eyeglasses. So he's unable to read the newspaper. He's unable to pick up on the substance of other people's thinking. And he wears eyeglasses because he doesn't see so well. So this is a novel about understanding, about seeing, and about not seeing. We are also introduced at the bottom of page 1083 that the Pontelliers have two children. And motherhood is an important theme in this text in terms of how it's handled and how cultural views, how culture views motherhood. And we'll see again how that is handled in this text. Oftentimes, these scenes with children are, are very, I, I would say, superficial. They're very quick. Uh, the children are often accompanied by a nurse. So uh, this indicates, I think, a couple of things. One, it indicates that the Pontelliers, uh, another element of their wealth, they have a nursemaid who takes care of the children and does all the, uh, the, the quote-unquote difficult things about raising the children. And... What this also suggests is that there's a separation in terms of affection, uh, influence, and that sort of thing between the parents and the children. 
And so we're going to see how that, how motherhood and the interaction of the Ponteliers, particularly of Edna and her children, play out later in the text. On page 1084, a lot of imagery in this text, some of, some of the, I think, most beautiful passages in this text have to do with landscape. And <clears throat> I think that is uh, the case with a lot of the readings that I do. Landscape and the aesthetics of landscape are symbolic and also on a very human level, I think, are, are of interest and are very satisfying. And that, I think, is the case in The Awakening as well. Landscape, even though Grand Isle is separate from the hustle and bustle of New Orleans and Louisiana and the urban environment, so Grand Isle stands in some ways in opposition, at least in separation from the urban hustle and bustle, but then nature is another sort of separation from Grand Isle. There's always a sort of skewing or unbalancedness, if you will, in what uh, the text I think is trying to relate or in terms of Edna's desire, the things that are of interest to her. On page 1084, we have a lot of colors in this text. Uh, a white sunshade, yellow chamomile, blue of the horizon, uh, a pink line shelter. Uh, this text really plays, I think, with our senses, all of them. And this, this I think, is, is Chopin's uh, excellent writing. Uh, Chopin engages all of our senses. This is a complete sensory experience. Well, Edna doesn't do what she's supposed to do. She doesn't do what she's told by Mr. Pontellier, and we find that out here on page 1084. A um, couple paragraphs down, three paragraphs down. You are burnt beyond recognition, he added, looking at his wife as one, uh, as one looks at a valuable piece of personal property. Those sorts of statements should stand out to us quite flagrantly. What is going on here? Well, one, that she's burnt, not following the rules, not taking care of herself. This indicates, I think, a couple of things that Edna is not uh, interested in, in, in following Mr. Pontelli's direction. We see this rebelliousness throughout the text. Uh, two, Edna is not necessarily interested in taking care of herself in some ways. It's not a good idea to get burned. Uh, all sorts of bad things can happen. And he doesn't recognize her. This is a furthering of not being able to read, not being able to see his wife for the things that, um, the, the sorts of uh, things that his wife is interested in, uh, the sorts of things that his wife is trying to tell him. And we see a valuable piece of personal property. Okay, this is the classic commodification of women. This is Mr. Pontellier telling his wife, you are not an I, you are commodity. And what is commodity? Something that I, as the man, Mr. Pontellier, something that he can control. Edna's difference. What is interesting here is, is often when we talk of commodification, we talk of sexual commodification or sexual objectification. That is not necessarily the case here. We don't necessarily see a sexualization of Edna by men in this text. Rather, I would argue, we see a kind of, of sexualization of Edna by the text, not by the men in the text, but in the ways with which the text describes Edna's sense of, or, or at least Edna's person as being different from other people. Uh, she's described as, as being different, as being very beautiful, so on and so forth. On page 1085, the second paragraph, this is the beginning of chapter two, referring to Edna. Her eyebrows were a shade darker than her hair. They were thick and almost horizontal, emphasizing the depth of her eyes. She was rather handsome than beautiful. Her face was captivating by reason of a certain frankness of expression and a contradictory subtle play of features. Her manner was engaging. 
what I think is interesting is that in many ways, as again, we go further on into the text, some of the other characters might think Edna is a little bit flighty or lacks uh, a certain depth or lacks a certain substance, but it's really the complete opposite. The case is really the complete opposite that Edna feels in many ways more than anybody else does. We are also introduced to Robert very early on and Robert is closer in age to, to Edna, I think, than Edna is to her husband. Edna is younger than her husband. And Robert is the person that Edna is going to spend a lot of her time with in this text and whom her heart uh, perhaps is going to be broken when he leaves for a time to go to Mexico. And on, uh, in this second chapter, we are introduced to Robert and Robert and her are chatting away like birds, really underneath the nose of Mr. Pontellier. What does this say about Mr. Pontellier? Is he not paying attention to his wife? Sure, he's not paying attention. Uh, but is it okay that Edna has friends? Yes. Is it okay that Edna has male friends? Yes, it's okay that Edna has male friends. At a certain point, you would think, you would hope if Mr. Pontellier was paying attention, he would recognize the changing nature of Robert and Edna's relationship. And he really doesn't, uh, or he's unable to do so. What I think also separates Edna from this culture that she's in is that her background is, is in rural America. She doesn't seem to be comfortable. She certainly isn't interested in all of the protocols. And we see that later on when she doesn't want to return people, uh, people's cards, as they say, or callers to her, you know, as part of her responsibility as a wealthy patroness uh, to entertain other people that stop by their house. This is when summer is over. In part, it might explain uh, Chopin's, or excuse me, not Chopin, but Edna's background uh, may in part explain this. Another reason might be her, her growing rebelliousness as we get to later on in the novel. On the top of page 1086, Mrs. Pontellier, this is uh, her speaking with Robert, Mrs. Pontellier talked about her father's Mississippi plantation and her girlhood home in the old Kentucky bluegrass country. She was an American woman with a small infusion of French, which seemed to have been lost in dilution. Uh, so this is uh, a mixed identity, uh, as would be uh, perhaps expected in some ways. Uh, as America has moved forward in time and various other nationalities have joined in the American experiment, that Edna's identity comes from a mixed racial heritage and that she came from uh, a plantation home uh, in the South. So this is a kind of rural environment that Edna Pontellier had grown up in. When Mr. Pontellier is unhappy with what's going on at the home, when he is bored, when he wants to be entertained, what does Mr. Pontellier do? He goes to the club. When he's unhappy with a meal, he can go to the club. He can go travel. He can go socialize with his friends. He can do all sorts of things that Edna, as a woman, cannot quite do. She can go socialize with her friends, but she just can't up and go to the club. And we see this happen over and over again uh, for various reasons that Mr. Pontellier gets upset and then he just leaves. We see the effect on Grand Isle here in chapter three of what happens when Mr. Pontellier goes to the club and comes home and we see the way that he interacts with his wife. The beginning of chapter three on page 1086. It was 11 o'clock that night when Mr. Pontellier returned from Klein's hotel. He was in an excellent humor and high spirits and very talkative. His entrance awoke his wife who was in bed and fast asleep when he came in. He talked to her while he undressed, telling her anecdotes and bits of news and gossip that he had gathered during the day. Did Mr. Pontellier send a text message to Edna to let her know when he was coming home? Probably not. There were no text messaging. Um, that he woke her. I mean, uh, as being a married couple, you know, would Edna get up when her husband came home? Would they be interested in talking? 
Sure, why not? Because Married couples do that, right? When somebody comes home and it's like, oh, you're home, let's talk, we're worried, what's going on? Uh, that sort of thing. But there seems to be a difference here that Mr. Pontellier was very talkative, probably a little bit drunk, and he's telling her stories, and Edna was sleeping. And I get the sense here that he is sort of intruding on, on Edna's slumber says at the bottom of that first paragraph of chapter three, she was overcome with sleep and answered him with little half utterances. So that suggests to me that Edna wasn't all that interested. She was asleep. Yes, 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 I'm sleeping. Good for you. He's a little drunk. He wants to talk. He's wide awake. We also have some of our first strong information about the relationship between Mr. Pontellier and, and Mrs. Pontellier in terms of children, in terms of Mr. Pontellier's understanding of motherhood and the absence that he thinks that Edna is taking motherhood and her responsibilities of, of taking care of the children seriously. At the bottom of page 1086, Mr. Pontellier was quite sure Raoul had no fever. So Mr. Pontellier goes and checks on the children. Edna had put them to sleep. They are fine. Mr. Pontellier checks on them, comes back and says, I'm assuming wakes her up again because she is half asleep or had fallen asleep. The children are not well. Raoul is not well. He has a fever. Says at the bottom of the page, he reproached his wife with her inattention, her habitual neglect of the children. If it was not a mother's place to look after children, whose on earth was it? Further, <clears throat> the text says, he himself had his hands full with his brokerage business. He could not be in two places at once, making a living for his family on the street and staying at home to see that no harm befell them. He talked in a monotonous, insistent way. Is marriage a partnership? Absolutely. Should it be one of equality? Absolutely. So it, is there in part a divided set of responsibilities in this case for both Mr. Pontellier and Mrs. Pontellier? I, I think that there should be or that there could be, that it would be uh, handled if it was handled equitably, then it would be fair. Uh, Mrs. Pontellier is to take care of the children. That is part of her full-time job, just as Mr. Pontellier has his full-time job. But the way with which Mr. Pontellier is talking to his wife is what is problematic. And a few moments ago, I pointed out the passage where Edna Pontellier is commodified that he's a piece of property. And we see the power relations here in terms of Mr. Pontellier pointing out Edna's deficiencies in terms of motherhood. Now, does Edna have a problem with motherhood? Yes, I think in some ways this culture, late 19th, early 20th century, this wealthy, let's have a nursemaid raise our children, this is problematic, as well as Edna's general feeling about motherhood, or in many ways the absence of affection that Edna feels towards her children. That is also, I think, significant. Couple paragraphs down, Mrs. Pontellier by, was by that time thoroughly awake. She began to cry a little. And then a little bit further down, the tears came so fast to Mrs. Pontellier's eyes that the damp sleeve of her panoir no longer served to dry them. Couple lines further down, she could not have told why she was crying. This I think is very important. Edna is upset well, Edna could be upset really for a couple of reasons. Edna is upset because her husband said something uh, hurtful to her at that particular moment. You are not taking care of the children. I'm the man. I'm, I'm the breadwinner. I'm making all the money so we can live this lifestyle. What are you doing? You're supposed to do your job and you're not. That can be very hurtful. That is hurtful. So it would seem reasonable that Edna would respond. The second thing that I'm thinking about, however, is that there are moments throughout this text where Edna cries. Now, traditionally, we would say, we would say traditionally that women cry 
that's how they express themselves. Men express themselves in different ways. So it seems fitting that Edna cries. Okay, maybe, maybe not. But the frequency of Edna's crying and the association or the context of Edna's crying is something that I think we need to pay attention to. Could Edna be reacting to what Mr. Pontellier is saying? Sure, she could be reacting to that. But again, the frequency of her crying is often separate from what is going on at that particular moment in the text. There are moments in this text where Edna begins to cry and there is no explosion. There is no real interaction that these feelings that have been that that Edna has had an inability to express an inability to communicate, whether it's to um, uh, Madame Rees or uh, Rossignol or her husband or Robert, she just can't reconcile with her sadness and almost impulsively she cries. This is problematic. This speaks to the depths of anguish that Edna is feeling. It says here the third paragraph on the bottom on page 1087 that there is an indescribable oppression. So this is not an acute moment. This is not something that is just taking place that she's reacting to. This has been building for some time. How long? Who knows? Maybe since her marriage, since they were on Grand Isle, perhaps this has been growing since her childhood. Um, at the bottom of that paragraph that begins an indescribable oppression, I want to read, she was just having a good cry all to herself. The mosquitoes made merry over her biting, uh, excuse me, the mosquitoes made merry over her biting her firm round arms and nipping at her bare insteps. Uh, insteps. Okay, there's um, that she really isn't paying attention to the mosquitoes. This this falls, I think, under the category of, of, of a variety of other things that Edna just doesn't really pay attention to. Now, it seems to make sense. She's having a good cry. She There's an indescribable oppression. Mosquitoes are biting. She's, she doesn't notice. But along with the sunburn, along with a variety of other things, Edna is thinking... She's a deep thinker, and she is concentrating on maybe her interior life, sometimes at the expense of what is going on in the current moment, sometimes in terms of her health, in terms of her safety. This is also, I think, an intimate moment, and we see vignettes here. We see descriptions of Edna's body in various sorts of ways, where we don't see the description of Edna's body is through the eyes, I think, of Mr. Pontellier in terms of his wife being a sexual woman, in terms of being uh, a woman that he desires. I think there's an absence of that desire displayed by Mr. Pontellier, but the text gives us bits and pieces of Edna's body. Now, now I say bits and pieces. These are almost dismembered parts of Edna's body, which may be representative of the kind of fragmentation that Edna is feeling. So her round, her firm round arms nipping at her bare insta uh, insteps. We're talking about mosquitoes. If we were talking about Robert or her husband or, or excuse me, uh, or Edna's husband, then we would have a very different sense. But what we do see are parts of very vulnerable and revealed parts of Edna's body. This vulnerability and the consciousness of one's body is something that Edna is going to slowly come to recognize and reclaim later on in the text. Now, as we close out chapter three and we begin chapter four, there's another sequence about uh, really how the text or how their circle of friends views the Pontelliers, that Mr. Pontellier uh, was considered uh, the best husband in the world. All the ladies agreed to that. And I think, again, it's in, in many ways, Mr. Pontellier is, is a halfway decent guy. 
he does things that are to the best of his ability, at least, uh, and, and the best of his ability, uh, I think, in many ways, isn't good enough. But he's considered a pretty good guy, at least from the circle of ladies in their social circles. But Mr. Pontellier and the text also capitalize on this idea that Edna is not really the greatest of mothers. The bottom of page 1088, in short, Mrs. Pontellier was not a mother woman. The mother women seemed to prevail that summer at Grand Isle. So what is a mother woman? Well, at Grand Isle, uh, the women took their children, they took them bathing, they stayed with them, they did all sorts of things. This is not what Edna was interested in. And it is the text bringing this to our attention as a kind of social critique that Edna does not feel the same way about her children that other women do. What does this mean? What does this say about Edna? Does it say that she's necessarily a bad mother? Maybe, maybe not. I mean, I think there's an argument that Edna is not the most attentive and there's all sorts of dynamics that come into play because a nursemaid is really raising the children. But what I think this suggests is uh, a furthering of this alienation of affection and, uh, you know, the children being a part of the family. If Edna isn't really interested in raising them or loving them, what does this say about Edna and her ability to make attachments. Can Edna love somebody else if she is not comfortable with her own self? In opposition to Edna, one of her friends is Madame Ratignol. And Ratignol is described on page 1089, second paragraph, five lines down. There are no words Four lines down. There are no words to describe her save the old ones that have served so often to picture the bygone heroine of romance and the fair lady of our dreams. There was nothing subtle or hidden about her charms. This is not a criticism. This The text is saying that Ratignol is a good mother. She dodes on her children. This is not necessarily an overindulgence. So she's not a helicopter. She just loves her children and wants to be around them. I think what this does is it serves the, the, the purpose of, of just showing difference between a mother woman and Edna. Now, Ratignol and Edna are, are friends and uh, they interact uh, together. Ratignol uh, plays music and they interact together and Edna feels comfortable in her presence. And I think there may be a kind of uh, desire, a sort of displaced desire uh, from Edna's childhood about her own mother figure and things like that. But perhaps we'll get into that a little bit later. What also Ratignol represents is the, the sort of expectations of culture about what a woman should be doing, what a mother should be doing. And later on, uh, further down on that page, 1089, we see that Edna has to do some sewing because that is what other women are doing. This is not something Edna is interested in. Okay, on page 1090, chapter 5, we have some more information about Robert and how he is viewed by others within the community. Second paragraph, chapter 5, 1090. Anybody with me? Excellent. He had lived in her shadow during the past month. No one thought anything of it. Many had predicted that Robert would devote himself to Mrs. Pontellier when he arrived since the age of 15, which was 11 years before. Robert, each summer at Grand Isle, had constituted himself the devoted attendant of some fair dame or damsel. Sometimes it was a young girl, again a widow, but as often as not, it was some interesting married woman. So Robert is this, you know, good-looking guy, a single young man. And people know that he sort of vacillates depending on the year to, to different women. And um, people were sort of speculating that this was the summer he was going to find interest in Edna. How is this handled? Well, on one hand, people didn't really recognize the sorts of feelings that Edna was, was experiencing. Edna wasn't communicating these things. 
um, people didn't quite understand Robert's full intentions. Uh, again, a, a sort of misunderstanding of passion. And one of, I think, the really important symbols of this text are the lovers that are always sort of circulating in and around all of these, uh, all of these people as to show, as a kind of foil, if you will, to show the difference in the lovers are interested in love and passion and everybody else isn't necessarily, except for Edna and Robert. And so they, they trust Robert. In this culture, uh, in this um, uh, group of people, yeah, men and women are friends. And even though Robert is a young, good-looking guy, yeah, Edna's married. They don't think anything of that, that the institution of marriage is strong and whatever feelings Robert may or may not develop, it doesn't matter. Edna is a wife of Mr. Pontellier. We're going to speak more about children, but often in this text, people of lower, uh, people that exist at the lower socioeconomic level, those that are poor, uh, the nursemaid uh, here called the quadroon, on page 1092, th these people don't really have identities. If you are poor, if you are uh, have uh, uh, any brown in you, if you have any black in you, you're not even considered a person. And so Edna, the text tells us that she is a uh, commodity. The wife of a husband is commodity. Well, a little bit underneath that are these sort of service people or these brown people or black people, Hispanic people, whatever that might be in this text to be seen and not really heard, much like the children. And I think there's a kind of relationship between them. And so on page 1092, one, two, three, four, five, six paragraphs down, the youngsters came tumbling up the steps, the quadroon following at the respectful distance. She is supposed to take care of the children, but not intrude or interact in the lives of the Ponteliers. And this then is, uh, again, these sort of moments of landscape, which are I think are going to increase as we move through this text. They are breaks from the discussions on motherhood and childhood and, and race relations, social relations, alienation, and all of those sorts of things. The, the, the moments of landscape are breaks from those, moments of beauty, the beauty that I think later on Edna is trying to capture as an artiste, and then, of course, there are also moments of foreshadowing about what's going to happen at the end of the text. Next paragraph. The sun was low in the west, and the breeze soft and languorous that came up from the south, charged with the seductive odor of the sea. Children freshly burfurbellowed were gathering for their games under the oaks, their voices were high and penetrating, the seductive odor of the sea. The symbol of the sea in this text is dynamic. It's multitudinous. It does not mean one thing. It means a lot of different things. And I think it means some things at one moment in the text, and it may mean something different at a later moment in the text. Here there's something seductive. The sea represents the mystery of passion, of eroticism, desire for intimacy. This I think is going to change when we get to the end of this text, but it has that kind of alluring quality here. So the children are present uh, as we close out chapter five, but we don't really see a lot of interaction between Edna and her children. They are in the background, in the distance, if you will, not necessarily spatially, but psychologically, metaphorically. Edna, we don't get the sense that Edna is close with her children. And we don't really see a whole lot of dialogue or direct interaction uh, between Edna and her children. And it is at this moment, and I think there are several sort of major moments of epiphany, major moments that 
mark Edna's transformation or the beginning of her transformation. And chapter six, I think, is one of those important moments. Chapter six, page 1093. Edna Pontellier could not have told why, wishing to go to the beach with Robert, she should in the first place have declined and in the second place have followed in obedience to one of the two contradictory impulses which impelled her. I think the word impulse is important. Impulse stands in opposition to premeditation, to thoughtful thinking. And when we are guided by impulses, yes, you know, you, you haven't thought something, uh, something through, but it also comes from a place that we are not aware of. So faced with several possibilities, going with her husband, being with her children, those might be decisions that, if they were well thought out, might have been something that Edna decided on doing, but rather this was an impulsive, and these impulses lead Edna to do other things. Let me keep reading. A certain light was beginning to dawn dimly within her, light which showing the way forbids it. At that early period, it served to, but it served but to bewilder her. It moved her to dreams, to thoughtfulness, to the shadowy anguish which had overcome her the midnight when she had abandoned herself to tears. So Edna is recognizing something. The unconscious is becoming conscious. And I, and I think that um, it's worthwhile to, to sort of speak about this in that way. Whatever had been bothering Edna, her childhood, her dreams, uh, for the future, her desires, her inner life. Those all have to be subservient to her outer life. What is Edna's outer life? Her responsibilities to her family, her responsibilities to uh, her culture, her, the, uh, her responsibilities to everything that or anyone that Edna interacts with. And it, it's slowly occurring to Edna that those things are either in opposition or maybe we can say in a different direction than the things that Edna is beginning to realize about her truer self, about her self-understanding. And later on, we'll say about her woman strength, her women, uh, her woman identity. In short, Mrs. Pontellier was beginning to realize her position in the universe as a human being. Let me add, not as a commodity. And to recognize her relations as an individual to the world within and about her. This may seem like a ponderous weight of wisdom to descend upon the soul of a young woman at 28, perhaps more wisdom than the Holy Ghost is usually pleased to vouchsafe to any woman. I think it's interesting here because uh, invoking the Holy Ghost, and there's a scene a little bit later on where Edna is in church, and we're talking about, I think, how Edna as a woman coming to various realizations that are in opposition to certain institutions, to the institution in some ways of family, to the institution of patriarchy, to the institution uh, in terms of society being patriarchal, to the institution of religion. So these are all things that Edna's interior life, as it's slowly becoming conscious, has to fight against, much like the sort of metaphor of the waves, which is used periodically in this text. But to the beginning of things of a world especially is necessarily vague, tangled, chaotic, and exceedingly disturbing. How few of us ever emerge from such beginning. How many souls perish in its Talmud? What is the text telling us here? That Edna's slow understanding, the emergence, just the very beginning of an understanding is often where other people like Edna stop. They stop at this beginning moment of transformation. But for Edna, Edna is going to take this transformation further. The voice of the sea. Now we move again to the sea. So we have sometimes uh, cultural responsibility, interaction with husband and figures within her 
uh, the family institution, the cultural institution. We're talking about the uh, antagonism, this uh, awareness of the antagonism between the interior life, the interior desire that Edna has, and the exterior world. And these moments of the sea sort of interrupt that. The voice of the sea is seductive, never ceasing, whispering, clamoring, murmuring, inviting the soul to wander for a spell in abysses of solitude to lose itself in mazes of inward contemplation. The voice of the sea speaks to the soul. Great, I think, alliteration there. The touch of the sea is sensuous and folding the body in its soft, close embrace. I think a lot of things going on in those few lines there. Again, we have, earlier we have the seductive odor of the sea. So, we have the, the sense of, of smell bringing us, uh, being this whole body sensation that Chopin, I think, is bringing the reader into uh, Edna's world. Now we have the voice. First, we have the smell. Now we have, we have olfactory. Now we have auditory. And the C is sexualized. It's anthropomorphic in this way. It's sexualized, it's desire, it's also mystery. It's also symbol of the unconscious. It's en enigmatic, right? I mean, this is, I mean, the sea is something that explorers have always been curious about. That the sea can be calm and beautiful and it can be stormy. And it's mysterious because we don't see what's underneath it. We just see what's on top. And so again, this becomes a kind of symbol for the unconscious. What is it that Edna is beginning to realize which had been buried in her unconscious? And the beginning of chapter seven, I think frames the dilemma quite nicely for us. The last line of that first paragraph in chapter seven at the bottom of page 1093, at a very early period, she had apprehended instinctively the dual life, the outward existence which conforms, the inward life which questions. Is this problematic? Well, for Edna, it's very problematic, but I think it raises some really interesting questions. Is this a problem that only Edna experiences, or is this a dynamic that only Edna experiences. On one side, we, as part of the human condition, as a, as a part of members of society, members of maybe religious institutions, members of uh, our families, what is it that we really want? What is it that we really want in life? And, and can we achieve those things? What about the masks we wear? The masks that you wear as a student or the mask that you wear when you are at work or the various sort of social contexts that you might negotiate or or circulate in we wear a kind of mask and is that mask you that mask is you i would imagine but it's also not you and i think in part this this text is questioning Edna's, but also our own. What is the real you? What is your real self? What is it? And what is the distance between that interior world and the exterior world? There's always going to be a difference, right? Now, I guess there doesn't have to be, but it seems that there would be, that we cannot always be the person we want to be, that we cannot always do the things that we want to do, that Oftentimes, the dreams and desires that we have had in our past do not get worked out as adults. And I think that's also a way that we can sort of consider this novel, that in many ways, Edna is childlike, and that this is part of the maturation process. Is it a part 
of the maturation process. Is part of that maturation process, is part of that socializing process that we move from being children and teenagers to and, 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 and young people into the quote unquote adult world with mortgages and families and children? Do we have to accept giving up those dreams from our interior world? And hopefully those, the interior world in the exterior world, as I said, coincide fairly closely together. For Edna, they do not. On page 1094, Ratignol and Edna uh, spend some time together. Edna convinces Ratignol to leave her children behind so that Edna, because Edna isn't interested in having her children with her, that Edna just wants to spend some time with her friend. It says the second uh, second paragraph. The two women went away one morning to the beach together, arm in arm, under the huge white sunshade. Edna had prevailed upon Madame Ratignol to leave the children behind, though she could not induce her to relinquish a diminutive roll of needlework which Adele begged to be allowed to slip into the depths of her pocket. In some unaccountable way, they had escaped from Robert. So again, the, the sort of needlework. It says a little bit earlier that Edna had a sensuous susceptibility to beauty. Um, so what does this mean? What is beauty? We, later on, Edna becomes a painter and spends time at the expense of her social responsibilities to paint some things. And this, I would argue, is a way, is a kind of abstract way for Edna to express that which she is unable to to express. We are also told, uh, once again, about uh, Edna Pontellier's body. A couple paragraphs down, the women were both of goodly height, uh, Madame Ratignol possessing the more feminine and matronly figure, more motherly, I suppose. The charm of Edna Pontellier's physique stole insensibly upon you. The lines of her body were long, clean, and symmetrical. It was a body which occasionally fell into splendid poses. There was no suggestion of the trim, stereotype fashion played about it. A casual and indiscriminating observer, in passing, might not cast a second glance upon the figure, but with more feeling and discernment, he would have recognized the noble beauty of its modeling and the graceful severity of poise and movement, which made Edna Pontellier different from the crowd. So I had mentioned uh, a little bit earlier that these two figures of the of the the two lovers circulate throughout this text, and and they are sort of always in the background. That love exists, but not necessarily for the people that are centered in this text, except for Edna's growing feelings for Robert and and uh, uh, her later lover. So the two young lovers, but I want to point this particular moment out on page 1095 at the bottom of that second paragraph, the paragraph beginning the two seated themselves. Two young lovers were exchanging their hearts yearnings beneath the children's tent, which they had found unoccupied. What I find interesting about that is the association of the young lovers with children. So love, passion, desire seems to be something that is almost absent in the text, at least between husband and wife. The lovers, not married, represent, I think, uh, the passion that is the, here that is absent. But the association with children, I think, is interesting because does this suggest that love and passion and all of those sorts of things are childish desires. We learn a little bit later on that Edna had some infatuations when she was a child. So as part of the maturation process, part of becoming an adult, part of embracing the exterior world is at the expense of the interior world, but more than that, at the expense of your childhood dreams. Does love only exist when you are young and when you are older, it no longer exists? I don't think that is the case at all, but I think the text 
questions that and problematizes the environment that Edna is in. Let me continue reading. Edna Pontellier, casting her eyes about, had finally kept them at rest upon the sea. So again, another interval moment here. The day was clear and carried the gaze out as far as the blue sky went. There were a few white clouds suspended idly over the horizon. A lateen sail was visible in the direction of Cat Island, and others to the south seemed almost motionless in the far distance. So again, this interval, the young lovers associated with childhood, these two women that are spending time together. Let's look out at the sea. What does it mean? What does it offer? Before it's alluring, it's sexualized. Now it's just a moment of beauty, a moment of peace that I think stands in opposition to the interior life of Edna Pontellier. So Ratignol and Edna are sitting together, looking out at the sea. And second paragraph from the bottom on page 1096, Madame Ratignol lays her hand on Mrs. Pontellier. And the text says, the action was at first a little confusing to Edna, but she soon lent herself readily to the Creole's gentle caress. She was not accustomed to an outward and spoken expression of affection, either in herself or in others. What, is, what does this mean? Well, I think we are learning that Edna is interested in affection, is interested in love, but she doesn't know how to express herself. And there's certainly a fear of how it would be received by, let's say, her husband or other people in the social circle. Not by Robert, perhaps, because he sort of operates in this sort of strange, single, young, you know, young, single, uh, you know, sort of uh, independence that he has. But we learn a little bit more as to why Edna might be a little bit uncertain or unfamiliar with these expressions of affection. She and her younger sister Janet had quarreled a great deal through force of unfortunate habit. Her older sister Margaret was matronly and dignified, probably from having assumed matronly and housewifely responsibilities too early in life, their mother having died when they were quite young. A very important moment in Edna's life, the relationship between a daughter and her mother a sacred kind of relationship. And her mother had died when Edna was quite early and perhaps as a result of that had not overcome the trauma of her mother's death and grew up without that affection that she would have desired that she would hope for from her mother. Would she have gotten that from her father? It doesn't appear that that sort of affectionate relationship really existed. And the relationship between a daughter and a mother is a very different kind of relationship than a daughter and her father. This leads us into a moment of perhaps what I could call the dreams of love or infatuation of a young girl. On page one zero. Nine, seven. At a very early age, perhaps it was when she traversed the ocean of waving grass, she remembered that she had been passionately enamored of a, dig of a dignified and sad-eyed cavalry officer who visited her father in Kentucky. <clears throat> Interesting, for a couple of reasons. This cavalry officer who was visiting her father, I would think would be closer in age visiting her father would be closer in age to her father than would be to, uh, certainly to Edna as uh, a little girl. That Edna had fallen in love with the Calvary officer, if we dip our toe into psychoanalytic theory here for a moment, why would Edna fall in love with an older man who's coming to visit her father, I think as a kind of substitution 
for the love and affection that Edna was not getting from her own father, that the Calvary officer becomes an easy substitution for her father and is manifested in a love for him. So that, I think, explains in some ways that if, you know, so uh, since Edna's mother had died and there was an absence of affection in that way, there was also an absence of affection to a large extent between Edna and her father. Thus why this was displaced into a desire for the Calvary officer. The text also tells us that her marriage to her husband, Leonce Pontellier, uh, I am one, two, three paragraphs down from the bottom of page 1097. Her marriage to Leonce Pontellier was purely an accident in this respect, resembling many other marriages which masquerade as the decrees of fate. That does not sound very romantic to me. What was it that sort of solidified Edna marrying her husband? <clears throat> well, we are told, I think, Mr. Pontellier was, was courting her sincerely. Second paragraph from the bottom, the acme of bliss, which would have been a marriage with the uh, uh, tragedian, was not for her in this world as the devoted wife of a man who worshipped her. She felt she would take her place with a certain dignity in the world of reality, closing the portals forever behind her upon the realm of romance and dreams. So my earlier thoughts about interior and the exterior and, and, and social maturation and, and uh, growing up into the adult world, there seems to be, this text suggests, a compromise. That you can't have the... Uh, you know, the, the realm of romance and dreams, you get something else. But Mr. Pontellier was devoted and courted her. And that, I think, makes him fall under the very, uh, you know, complicated category of Mr. Pontellier being a, a halfway decent guy. He was uh, interested in, in Edna, and he did the best that he could. We are then, as we close out Chapter 7, we are then told... At the top of the page, this is Edna. She was fond of her children in an uneven, impulsive way. Now, again, we've spoken about impulsivity and what that might mean. When you are impulsive, it's not something that's premeditated, something that is inconsistent. This is problematic because what does a child desire? A child most often desires love and affection from their parents. What does a child need? Consistency. And if Edna is impulsive, impulsiveness is the opposite of consistency. So when we talked earlier about, you know, was Edna or is Edna a good mother? This may suggest to us that Edna has some deficits if she's treating her children in an impulsive way. This is problematic. And this closes out chapter seven. So I wanna to bring to our attention something briefly on page 1098, uh, the beginning of chapter eight, uh, Madame Ratignol and Robert are walking together and she asks him to leave Mrs. Pontellier alone. So there seems to be in the social circle some awareness that even though Robert may be doing the same things that he's always done over the last few years, attaching himself to various women, married and unmarried, that they are recognizing not that Robert is doing something out of the ordinary, but recognizing that Edna is a little bit different and she may be succumbing to various temptations. I want to turn our attention now to, I think, um, uh, on page 1102. There are a lot of things here going on and uh, moments here that highlight some of the themes in this text and also symbolize some of the transformation that Edna might be uh, beginning here. Um, the text has a lot about music, a lot about being the artiste. 
Uh, why is that? What does it mean to be the artiste? Well, the artist, the writer, the painter is a way with which a person can not only communicate, I think, those things that are difficult to communicate, the emotional life, the interior life of that particular artist, but maybe more importantly, to communicate the human condition, to communicate those things that everybody around us is feeling but may not have awareness or the ability to communicate. So in this way, the, the artist is a, you know, plays a very, very important function in culture, in society. That you know, if there's this dichotomy between the dreams of youth or the interior life and the exterior life, then it's the artist that says, okay, I recognize something universally in us, in our community that you may not be aware of. And it is my responsibility, not only to myself, but to my culture to communicate these ideas. Okay. So on page 1102, <clears throat> there's a third paragraph down music and dancing and a recitation or two. The uh, Faraval twins are, are playing music. Uh, we're told a duet from Zampa and the poet and the peasant. Uh, and then we have this moment here. So, so first of all, we have music. It's a sort of a suspension of the responsibilities of culture, uh, people to unwind and to relax. And then you have this interesting moment here, I think, with the parrot. Uh, the next, uh, the next paragraph. Allez-vous en sa prestige, shrieked the parrot outside the door. He was listening to these gracious performances for the first time that summer. Old Monsieur Faraval, grandfather of the twins, grew indignant over the interruption and insisted upon having the bird removed and consigned to regions of darkness. Victor Lebrun objected, and his decrees were as immutable as those of fate. The parrot fortunately offered no further interruption to the entertainment, the whole venom of his nature apparently having been cherished up and hurled against the twins, in that one impetuous outburst. The parrot, the interpolation here, the insertion of the parrot in this moment seems to undermine what I had just said in some ways, that music and the artist, uh, the artist is, is a way to communicate these universal ideas of the human condition. And the parrot, who doesn't really understand uh, the language of people, I would think, parrots don't understand necessarily the language of people, is just uh, spouting out allez-vous en sa pristi. And this seems in some ways to create a caricature, a parody of the music and the dancing and whatnot that is going on here. A couple paragraphs down, we, we see a little girl who's performing a dance. And four lines down, it says, the child was the mistress of the situation. What does that mean? Well, I think of a few things, and I think this is uh, important in the overall theme of children and what they represent in this text. For the most part, children are to be seen and not heard. They show up, there's some interaction, then it's time for the nursemaid uh, to take them away and for them to go to bed. Um, they function to show the responsibility or irresponsibility of the parents. Uh, Edna may not be the greatest mother in the world uh, in terms of how she's judged by other people in her social circle, whereas, let's say, Ratignol is the idyllic mother and always doting upon her children. So children are not fully developed in this text, but I would suggest to us that this is uh, not because the author doesn't understand children, but a moment like this, I think, highlights the importance of children in terms of dreams of youth. The child was mistress of the situation. And what I think this suggests is that children are much more knowledgeable much more aware of things than they are given credit for. And this is a very romantic, and, and when I say romantic, I don't mean uh, romance, but 
But this is a very romantic notion, and I'm going to speak more about this when I wrap up my discussion much later, in terms of uh, the British romantics, in terms of American transcendentalism, uh, in terms of uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Emile, that children are not relegated or should not be relegated to the distant corners of the household or of society. That William Wordsworth says that the child is the father of man. And that children have a kind of uh, energy and curiosity. In this, I'm thinking uh, of American transcendentalism. Uh, a curiosity and energy that we lose as adults. And so I would suggest that the focus here on that the child has some control uh, over the situation, it touches upon this tradition. At the bottom of the page, second paragraph from the bottom, but there was no reason why everyone should not dance. But Tom Rat Ratignol could not, so it was she who gaily consented to play for the others. She played very well, keeping excellent waltz time and infusing an expression into the strains which was indeed inspiring. She was keeping up her music on account of the children, she said, because she and her husband both considered it a means of brightening the home and making it attractive. On page 1104, at the top of the page, uh, we have a commentary on Edna's reaction to music. Edna was what she herself called very fond of music, musical strains, well rendered, had a way of evoking pictures in her mind. So Edna is sort of reacting to this music. It's helping uh, her become more in touch with her feelings. And that then is going to facilitate her becoming an artist herself and to communicate the ideas that she's trying to explore within herself. About uh, three paragraphs further down, again on page 1104, I am uh, near the end of chapter nine. She, this is Edna, waited for the material pictures which she thought would gather and blaze before her imagination. She waited in vain. She saw no pictures of solitude, of hope, of longing, or of despair. She was the very passions themselves were aroused, but the, excuse me, but the very passions themselves were aroused within her soul, swaying it, lashing it, as the waves daily beat upon her splendid body. She trembled, she was choking, and the tears blinded her. Once again, we have these moments uh, that seemingly come out of nowhere, although right here this is evoked by the passion of the music, where Edna, uh, she is uh, unaware, perhaps, of the deeper feelings that motivate her um, her emotions, uh, her depression, her melancholia, her uncertainty, her sense of uh, skewed identity as she's trying to recover or rebuild her sense of self. So we see that here that um, she is, uh, these passions sway her and she is very emotional. We also have a conflation of the imagery of the waves as a metaphor for the emotional turmoil within her. And this is also a foreshadowing of what is going to happen at the end that, you know, we move back and forth with the imagery of the sea as being alluring and uh, uh, sexualized in some way. Now this is a kind of foreshadowing for her last trip out into the ocean uh, where the waves are beating against her and, and, and all of that sort of thing. And what I think is also an interesting expression here is upon her splendid body. So this, I think, suggests this continual uh, attempt to reappropriate her body from society, to understand her body both as uh, a fully thinking, woman-strong individual and in this as a woman with sexual desire. So this is, this is not just about the metaphysical, but also about the physical. And contained within the physical is knowing one's body, understanding one's sexual desire. Sort of framed uh, in this scene or these series of scenes in chapter 9 and chapter 10, uh, the ever-present lovers. 
and uh, the, uh, to further the uh, sort of thematic analysis that uh, I'm working on, on chapter nine, in chapter 9, uh, at the bottom page 1105 in chapter 10, about eight paragraphs, six paragraphs down, a feeling of exultation overtook her as if some power of significant import had been given her soul. She grew daring and reckless, overestimating her strength. She wanted to swim far out where no woman had swum before. And again, this is a foreshadowing uh, of the end of the text. Chapter 11 shows a scene between Edna and her husband, Mr. Pontellier. And Edna wants to stay outside and sleep. And this, uh, and Edna refuses to go inside. Uh, Mr. Pontellier tries to assert his, uh, the male dominance, the husband dominance within this, uh, uh, within the family here. And Edna shows rebelliousness. Now, is this the rebelliousness of youth? Is this the immaturity of Edna acting out? Uh, could be. Uh, this could also be Edna's rebelliousness in terms of trying to uh, appropriate herself and own herself once again. Now, is it wrong that Mr. Pontellier is upset with Edna for staying outside? I don't think so. Uh, I think it's reasonable. I, I think that Mr. Pontellier loves his wife. Is it the, the, the love of medieval romance? No. Is this the love of the lovers? The love of youth? No. But I think Mr. Pontellier cares in his way for Mrs. Pontellier. And what does he do to sort of showcase this? He says, you cannot stay out here. It says at the bottom of page 1108, Edna, dear, are you not coming in soon? He asked again, this time fondly with a note of entreaty. No, I'm going to stay out here. This is more than folly. This is Mr. Pontellier blurted out. I can't permit you to stay out there all night. You must come in the house instantly. Okay, so his language is domineering. Uh, yeah, I think so. But at the same time, I think it's out of a sincerity for his wife's safety. What does Mr. Pontellier do? I think uh, in, in a very sort of intimate moment, he stays outside with her. And this, uh, again, indicates the sincerity of his feeling towards his wife. On page 1109, one, two, three, four paragraphs down, Edna began to feel like one who awakens gradually out of a dream, a delicious, grotesque, impossible dream, to feel again the realities pressing into her soul. The physical need for sleep began to overtake her. The exuberance which had sustained and exalted her spirit left her helpless and yielding to the conditions which crowded her in. So this is a moment here where the text tells us that this slow awakening, and I think there are moments in the text where there are epiphanic moments, epiphany, where she realizes something all of a sudden, and in between these epiphanic moments uh, is this slow realization building to a kind of climax of a particular feeling, and this might be uh, one of those. Okay, I want to turn to the beginning of chapter 13. Uh, in my version, in the Heath Anthology of American Literature, Volume C, 7th edition. I'm on page 1112. Edna goes to church. A feeling of oppression and drowsiness came, uh, excuse me, a feeling of oppression and drowsiness overcame Edna during the service. Her head began to ache, and the lights on the altar swayed before her eyes. Another time she might have made an effort to regain her composure, but her one thought was to quit the stifling atmosphere of the church and reach the open air. And so what does she do? She leaves. She leaves church. What role does religion play? What role here at this moment does the church play? Well, couldn't we agree, at least in part, that people turn to religion? Well, people turn to religion for a variety of different reasons. Wouldn't one of those reasons be having to do with sadness or a traumatic situation, uh, understanding tragedy, understanding loneliness, that people turn towards religion um, perhaps when other modes to mitigate or alleviate 
one's circumstances or the way that one feels about one's circumstances has even failed. And if that is the case, when, when, when people turn to religion to regain some, some sense of uh, safety and comfort, how does that operate in this text? It doesn't work. So Edna, as she's coming to the slow realization of her awakening, she's also understanding at some level the very problematic situation it puts her in, primarily because she's different from other people. She thinks differently. She likes to do different things. And, she, and it also, this awakening is also an awakening of the deep unhappiness that she feels about a whole number of things. In church, hearing the words of liturgy and prayer and celebration or whatever else she might be experiencing there uh, or that is happening in the church, this fails her. So where Edna might turn to this particular institution, to the family, it fails her. Edna turns to the church and religion, it fails her. Maybe she wants to turn to Robert on a deeper level, that fails her. And all of these different areas sort of facilitate what is going to happen at the end of this text. In this very poignant moment, at the bottom of this page, uh, we return with images of the sea. How still it was, with only the voice of the sea whispering through the reeds that grew in the salt water pools. The long line of little gray Weather-beaten houses nestled peacefully among the orange trees. It must always have been God's day on that low, drowsy island, Edna thought. They stopped, leaning over a jagged fence made of sea drift, to ask for water. Uh, she's with uh, Robert right now. Um, so we return to the sea. It's soothing. Uh, I, I had a student at, at, uh, in the past say, um, well, maybe Edna is kind of crazy because and I remember the student said, maybe she believes the sea is talking to her, like in her brain, like Edna is schizophrenic or something. And uh, you know, I, I responded in this way, as I've uh, always responded uh, when we're talking about uh, mental challenges, mental illness, uh, anxiety, depression, what we want to avoid is pulling out the DSM-5 in diagnosing fictional characters with real uh, with real mental diseases. I think we can talk about in terms of anxiety and the unconscious and depression, but we don't want to say that Edna is actually schizophrenic or she's a borderline personality with hallucinatory uh, tendencies or, or whatnot because the sea is actually talking to her. I think this is metaphorical. The sea offers her something. Now, what I think is important as I just said a moment ago that these other various places that she turns to, these institutions, family, church, friends, they don't speak to her. The sea does in this metaphorical way. And this, again, is going to facilitate maybe this as last resort. On page 1113, one, two, three, four, five paragraphs down. And it's interesting because we're in this chapter where religion, I think, fails Edna. So I want to keep that in mind. Edna left, excuse me, Edna, left alone in the little side room, loosened her clothes, removing the greater part of them. She bathed her face, her neck and arms in the basin that stood between the windows. She took off her shoes and stockings and stretched herself in the very center of the high white bed. How luxurious it felt to rest, thus in a strange, quaint bed with its sweet country odor of laurel lingering about the streets and mattress, excuse me, about the sheets and mattress. She stretched her strong limbs that ached a little. She ran her fingers through her loosened hair for a while. She looked at her round arms as she held them straight up and rubbed them one after the other, observing closely, as if it were something she saw for the first time the fine, firm quality and texture of her flesh. She clasped her hands easily above her head, and it was thus she fell asleep. This is a very sensual moment where Edna is exploring her body, 
both in a physical and, a me and in a metaphysical way, again, to reappropriate, to relearn, to reconstruct her feminine identity, her ownership of woman's strength. And what I also find interesting is that she, she bathed her face, her neck, and her arms. This is a kind of baptism, a cleansing of her body. Again, another symbol of her awakening and a symbol of the futurity of her new woman identity. This stands in juxtaposition to the church, which is a part of this chapter. One, uh, you know, a ritual in uh, one of the many rituals in uh, the Christian faith is one of baptism, a cleansing, a rebirth. But organized or institutional religion fails Edna. And here we see the same imagery that would accompany the ritual of baptism, but on Edna's terms, a cleansing in Edna's terms, on Edna's terms, as opposed to a cleansing by institution. And I wanna close out part one with these thoughts as we close out chapter 13. I'm on page 1116, third paragraph from the bottom in the middle of the paragraph. Edna, she let her mind wander back over her stay at Grand Isle and she tried to discover where in the summer, so summer is over and they're uh, ready to return uh, to um, uh, New Orleans. This summer had been different from any and every other summer of her life. She could only realize that she herself, her present self, was in some way different from the other self. That she was seen with different eyes and making the acquaintance of new conditions in herself that colored and changed her environment, she did not yet suspect. So again, these sort of slow, the, the slow development to these climactical or epiphanic moments, moving back and forth between a certainty that something is changing and an uncertainty as to what that might be. Summer is over. Flamingo kid. Greece, uh, you know, this is the sort of uh, summer where things are uh, carefree and uh, maybe an infatuation, a love, summer's over, people go back to school, uh, vacations are over, the weather changes, people go back to their real lives. Isn't, isn't that how sometimes we, we think of summer? Uh, summer camp and going to the beach and, and long weekends if you're able to do that. Well, in some ways, that's what Edna has experienced. But more than that, this summer for Edna has created a movement towards this new identity. And now that she's returning to her quote unquote regular life in the city, we have a very, I think, confused and uncertain Edna. This will conclude the discussion of part one. Thank you.